the greatest podcast that features two NBA players, JJ and LeBron James, Mind the Game podcast, put out a clip. Uh, but one of the ones that is is really just grinding my gears a little bit is the one where he talked about his time in Miami. Um, so let me play this quick little 30 seconds. Obviously, my, my first year in Miami, yeah, we had a big three. Everyone said it's a super team, super team and super team that. We had to build our team around all minimum guys, which was still okay, but we didn't fill out the complimented guys enough. Yeah, we had Rio, we had Udonis, you know, but we didn't we didn't have enough as far as enough complimented guys to actually make it all work. And we still made it to the finals. Obviously, my now let me let me let me be clear as producer Cruz texts me. Um, first of all, this guy, Jacob, the Clipper is a scrub. We Thank didn't you. have enough complimentary guys to make it all work. Bron is using his podcast to start his revisionist history campaign. Before that season started, they were claiming they were going to win seven championships. Now he is saying he did not have enough. Now, let me ask y'all this. Based off of that 30 seconds that y'all saw, is that what y'all got from that? That he didn't have enough? Well, that that he's using this podcast to revise his history and that yeah, he didn't no. have enough. No, um, no I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting he's trying to revise history. I felt, if anything, that was kind of a jab at Mario Chalmers for the shit he's been saying in terms of LeBron over the recent years and even some shit Yadonis might have said, a jab at them. Yeah, we had Rio. We had Yadonis. Still wasn't enough, <laughs> and we did not have enough around them niggas. So, mm, what do you want me to do? That's what I got from it. But trying to revise, like, do revisionist history, nah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how you can revise history when this is your first time actually speaking about your own history. Like everything else has just been other people talking about his history. But again, the the beauty of this podcast to me is this is for the first time LeBron for multiple episodes uh, and continuously. I don't know how long this is gonna last. Is actually talking about his career. From his mouth, so. Um, for me, I'm not gonna lie. No, I know the agenda is essentially LeBron's on the mic to fix all the hate takes, but I don't see I don't see how that's anything beyond maybe potentially LeBron being petty, maybe. But that's again one of those things you have to look at. LeBron hating glasses. I don't think it's anything more than exactly what he said. But it's just, this just seems like a typical YouTube comment on Twitter. So the reason why I have Jacob the Clipper blocked is because he's one of the ones that was, um, he was one of the ones peddling the whole, oh, Bron didn't go to Kobe's funeral and he didn't go to Kobe's statue unveiling. So no. they're not friends. He's what, yeah, he's one of those people. Um, but no, I, I, I saw the entirety of the podcast. And again, they were talking about the evolution of the game, how when he was in the league, uh, when it started, there was this type of spacing and they showed some pictures and stuff like that and what he averaged and all this. Um, but then, you know, how the game uh, uh, evolved and changed, how spacing became more prevalent, et cetera, et cetera. They get to forming a big three, a super team, and then what we consider to be complementary players, who's the best player, who's the most important player, et cetera, et cetera. That's the clip that B-Souls wanted Dalmo to see. And I can play that in a second too. Um, but right, I don't think that he's revising history. I think he's just letting people know, hey, when we made that switch to Miami, we were running this type of scheme. We didn't have all the players to try to run this type of scheme. He talks about how uh, um, Spo, after the first loss, went to Chip Kelly in order to figure out how a spread offense in football could be translated to a spread offense in basketball. Um. But if we remember who was on those teams the first year of Miami, I think that y'all would probably say that this wasn't the greatest cast in the world. I'm going to run down this. None of the teams were. None. People are misremembering the actual supporting cast the Miami Heat team had. Like, we're actually running with. They weren't really deep. None of the teams were really deep. None. This was I'll go on record team. saying that. This was LeBron James, D Wade, Chris Bosch. This is the first year. Remember, it's the first year. 32 year old Mike Bibby, 30 year old Udonis Haslam, 24 year old Mario Chalmers, 30 year old Mike Miller, 31 year old Carlos Arroyo, 
Joel Anthony, 30-year-old James Jones, 32-year-old Eddie House, Eric Dampier, who was 35, Big Z, who was 35, Jawan Howard, who was 37, Dexter Pittman, who was 22, Jerry Stackhouse, who was 36, Jamal McGlure, who was 32. What about, and I know we got caught up in the moment, but what about that team right there says, like, this is a good team outside of the first three? I think that's the thing, though, in that era, and and obviously there's deeper teams in that era. I think the Dallas Mavericks were clearly a deeper team in that era. Hence why they won. I think the Lakers were a deeper team in that era. I think a team like Celtics were formed in that era. But I think the narrative, let alone even even to a degree, just straight up reality was, yo, them three is enough. Um, Because they were all, at that point in their career, man, like people were still debating. I know it's going to sound foreign to a lot of the comment section, but and people at that time were literally debating who's better between Dwayne Wade and LeBron James there. So that's the level of Dwayne Wade was on. And then you had Chris Bosh, who clearly was the third guy, but he was fucking Chris Bosh. He was that like point. top 15, so, top 10. Yeah, 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 at floor top 15. So at that point in time, people were like, that's enough. Now, I agree with you guys. Uh, 2011 is easily the, well, ooh, 2014, they pretty old. But I probably would still say 2011 in terms of, the uh, the names that are supposed to hoop, yeah, that's probably the weakest roster there for sure. Um, I would I would push I would I would hold back on 2013. I think that roster is really good in my opinion, uh, despite being very old. But um, besides that, ultimately, I think the issue is because we were raised hearing all the media narratives. The only quote we had was not one, not two, not three, and we were raised on Skip Bayless basically saying, "LeBron, what are you doing?" And we were raised on LeBron James getting called the Frozen One, Stephen A. Rants, and things like that. These people, as Souls mentioned, about LeBron never really revising anything, but that's how it feels because these people have impacted the sports media so much, so it feels like LeBron is revising something. And in reality, nobody ever really just came to their own conclude conclusion and opinion. Now. For me, I'm a always saying y'all again. I I checked the comments recently. Just I was bored. Same shit. So I already know what's gonna go down there. But I'm down the middle again. Two things can be true at once. LeBron's roster. When you really pay attention to it, 2011, yeah, 2014, yeah. But are we gonna sit here and act like LeBron played fantastic in 2011? No. <laughs> not, not even close. Omar Omar has died on the hill saying as to why and explaining that, but I'm just talking about at the end of the day, he did not play well. 2014, I don't blame him at all. And, hey, look, I'm chatting too much, but I just think people never made their own opinion, and as a result, it feels like things is, are being revised, when that's not the case. That's exactly what it was, and Viso spoke on it when he said <clears throat> he was absolutely right. This is the first time LeBron has talked about his career. Outside of this, all you could hear about what LeBron thinks is if Brian Windhorst said it. And even then he said allegedly. Like, I don't – like, unless Rich Paul gave you one quote every three months. Like, you never heard LeBron really speak on anything. We had a little bit of it with Barbershop Talk, but even then he wasn't addressing everything in his career. He was just talking about big moments or recent yeah. things that happened. So that was the first time we heard LeBron start to speak on stuff. People liked it. But when you have people who have made a career off of – Dick sucking LeBron, a career off, literally a legacy off of LeBron. They say it is say the nail right on the head. It's very easy for everybody to assume he's rewriting history when history's been being told to us from a very biased viewpoint. Like imagine instead of imagine there was a book written about Jesus, and imagine if Jesus wrote a book. That's what this is like. Niggas is telling you about Jesus. Niggas is telling you about what Jesus did versus. Jesus telling you, and I'm not saying LeBron is Jesus, but I'm just. Yeah. Well, yes. well, let me let well, me stop. Say, no, let me stop. Let me, let me <laughs> say because I, I think I think the the actual problem is is that we very seldomly want to hear from losers, like in reality. Now, and that's going to be pretty thematic as to what we get into next. God, we're so good with that sometimes, but when somebody loses, we love to shove a mic into their face. And why didn't they speak? Why didn't they speak? Why didn't they speak at media day? But in reality, we never like what they say. There is going to be always a large opposition to whatever the fuck they say. Oh, literally a large opposition. So even in real time, didn't nobody want to hear what LeBron had to say uh, uh, um, 
after 2011. Like nobody saw, nobody really remembers, nobody even cares. Um, and even today, him saying, because mind you, before this clip, and I don't play the whole thing just because we're here. Before this clip, he says, look, I played terrible. I played like shit in 2011, no excuse. You think Jacob the Clipper wanted to have that in his context? He said that multiple times in that podcast. I think he said like two or three times. No, nobody wants to hear that. We want to hear, okay, what's the excuse that you can use so we can use that excuse against you? But as I remember, as the oldest one on this podcast, when that season was coming around, the question was, uh, 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 okay, who, who's going to play point guard for this team? Who's going to play? That was the biggest, That was one of the biggest questions going into the season. Yeah, they got the big three. They got the big three. Uh, but how can you fill this out? Oh, oh, we can get Mike Miller. Mike Miller can be the point guard. We'll just get Mike Miller to be the point guard. They didn't have a real point guard or whatever. Uh, Carlos Arroyo and all them. They didn't have no real point guard. But the question, oh, we can get Mike Miller, and he can play point guard in the lineup with Mike Miller, D-Wade, and LeBron James, and Chris Bosh, and you don't have, that, that should be able to get it done. But now as an adult, thinking about going into that that season with that mentality, as somebody who just watched the Hawks go into a season, and this is like two seasons ago, without a backup point guard even, that's the stu- that's the stupidest way to build a team. And we not, again, we don't talk about these things. He also talks about being in um, Cleveland and how they built their team specifically for the Celtics because the Celtics were running two bigs. They were going to build a team specifically for the Celtics. They had no other op- – they never practiced anything else. They never did anything else. They, they never did. They never beat us, huh? Damn. And so they, – and they never beat you. But Damn. what I'm saying that to say is they ran it with two bigs. This is the year they run into Orlando, and they have no answer for Rashard Lewis and Hedo Turkoglu. They have no – and LeBron's saying this. Yo, we have no answer. We I have, think – have- I think the help around the big three was overblown, but asking what was that team outside of the big three is kind of like, what is Steph Curry without shooting? Like the big three was the the main attraction to that team. Um, and when again, when, when they were saying going into the season, not four, not five, not six, they did start off shaky, but then they ended up with the season with a 59 win uh, regular season and then swept through the first round. Um, the next round ended in five games. The next one ended in five games. It was three, three, four ones. They did three, four ones. It's like at that point, I felt like, oh shit. Okay. This is a super team. That is all you need. So, and also in the, in that time as well, I also feel like the league wasn't as talented as it is right now. I feel like right now, just forming a big three is not enough to get you a first seed to dominate the league the way the Miami Heat did back then. Well, back then I do feel like it was a, a different era where you could get away with that, especially if that big three is LeBron, D Wade, and Chris Bosch all in their mid twenties. That was the crazy thing about that that big three was when big threes used to form, it it used to be like later years type shit. Like when Paul Pierce, Ray, and KG formed, they just entered their their thirties. When Hakeem, Charles Barkley, and Clyde, they were already well into their thirties. When Wilt, uh Jerry and Elgin, same thing. But the thing that like scared people with that specific big three was yo this big three hasn't even entered their prime and uh they're already playing this way so oh that's i don't know if that's true because d wade was already on the decline in 2011 they were in their prime they were in their prime when they got together they were in the beginning they were in their prime Ah. d wade was already in the decline in 2011 his knees were fucked i'd say i mean he declines in 2013 I'll tell you, he was definitely in his prime. Bosch, Bosch had a reserve role. That's really unfair to him. Um, I mean, at the, at the very Bosch least, Bosch was good as far as 2016, and then LeBron. Mm-hmm. I'll give you that. LeBron was entering his prime. Let me and and let me clear it up because I know niggas is gonna misunderstand what I'm saying. <clears throat> two the uh, what was this? 0809 was the MVP season. Those mm-hmm. two years where he plays like 51 games. Like the story was kind of out on his knees from my remembrance. That may have been true, but in, but in terms of performance, you're talking about the very next year after playing 51 games, he played 79 games and finished and 30. And, 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 then I, we're, and again, we're, if we're just saying in 2011, he t- literally is still in his prime. In 2011, we're talking about him playing 76 games, damn near 40 minutes a game, giving you 25 and 
25, 6, and 5, 7 MVP voting, POY votes, all that, second team on NBA, and it wasn't just because of the big three. Like, he was actually performing. The years following, I feel you, fell off a cliff, his knees finally imploded. Yeah, post-2011, yeah. But okay, 2011 I, I, specifically. I'd, I'd even say maybe 2012, 20 for 13. He's not even remotely. I, close I can give problem, you that. I can give you that from a statistical standpoint. I just remember he was moving. He was moving a certain way. And then I guess you could say, okay, in 2010 and 2011, I'll give you that. Fuck it. I'm not even going to take that away. I don't even want people to listen to that and say, oh, okay, we'll let him jump on Omar. The the decline was fast. Like yeah, it was yeah, fast, yeah. though. He Indeed. definitely exited his prime immediately. Yeah, anybody would, think he was in his prime is 2013, you're insane. Yeah. I'll say that for and, sure. And, you know. and I hear what you're I, saying, these souls. I don't necessarily disagree. I think that now as adults, though, and now as people who aren't listening to Skip Bayless every single day, and that just that could be even for the adults that aren't listening to Skip Bayless every single day. We now understand, though, that the idea of a three, it was lofty. Like a three doing seven without the rest of the roster being constructed was extremely lofty Um, because if they didn't do those shifts, if they didn't acquire better talent the next year and the years to follow, like they were going to lose. In hindsight, they would have lost all of them. Like they would have lost to OKC, who I deem to be probably a more complete team at the time, uh, one through five. They would have lost to San Antonio both times, who I deem to be a complete team, more complete team, one through five as well. 